Well, let us call this to order. The, uh, the regular meeting of the Woodland Park Planning Commission as of June 13th. Uh, we'll start off with the uh, order and roll call. Here. Here. Mr. Here. Here. All members are present this evening. If you would join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Anybody have any comments about the May 7th minutes? Any questions, changes, corrections? If not, I look for a motion to approve those. Second. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Approved. Um, we have on the schedule tonight uh, a public hearing, and I'll read this. It's uh, PUD 19-001 and sub 19-005. A request, request by David Gar Dave Garrison, landowner for a plan unit development, PUD amendment and preliminary plat for 26 single family residential lots on 20.61 acres on lot 2 Day Spring Christian Fellowship 205 Sourdough Road, Road in the Shining Mountain PUD zone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'd like to begin tonight's case with uh, Thomas and Thomas, the applicant, and Jim Hauk will be presenting for Ramir, who is not here tonight. Um, and then after Jim uh, does his presentation, staff will do uh, the compliance. And I would ask that we could hold all questions till after staff's done with their presentation to move this law. Thank you. Name, rank, serial number. Serial number. Yes, sir. Jim Hauk with Thomas and Thomas. We're landscape architects and planners for the project. Uh, we do represent uh, Mr. Garrison and his his team, um, and we have both Mr. Garrison and his builder available. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Not so much. Everybody hear him all right? This I better. I see yeses and noes. Better. Better. Okay. Okay. So I start over. No. No, we're good. Okay. Yeah, we got you. Uh, as mentioned, we we have both the client and his uh, support staff and uh, builder available for questions if there's some questions about quality and character and so forth at the end of the day. Um, but we'll kind of go through kind of the overview of the project and, and some of the considerations, and then obviously we'll pass it off for uh, process and, and entitlement uh, comments from the staff. Uh, and most of all, we thank you, staff, for walking us through all this. This is our first time to your, uh, to your little room here and, and before your board, so we appreciate the time. Um, let's go. Uh, again, just a kind of a, a overview, real high elevated uh, view here. Again, 20 acres, uh, this is lot two of the Day Springs project. We're looking at 26 proposing 26 units or lots on this property. Um, we really want to identify some of the natural features as we go through this process as well. Again, just <coughs> zooming in a little bit more for context, uh, you begin to see the golf course and even more so here as you look at 67, um, the golf course entrance uh, and then the entrance in here and then and also sourdough. Um, as mentioned, 26 units, uh, lots, um, the average rainy, ranging at about 21,000 or 21,000 square feet lots. Uh, that's pretty consistent with what we have to the, to the east as well. Um, our primary access is off sourdough and um, we are looking at public roads. I know that was a clarification that was made in the, the cover sheet just recently this week. Um, 
we have private driveways, but public roads. So at the end of the day, they would be dedicated to the city. Uh, we did ask for a variance for the 45-foot right-of-way, so a five-foot relief there. Again, in an effort to do some preservation, uh, being conscious of the preservation and character of the site as well. And we have a few pictures here just to illustrate uh, the site itself and kind of that mature stand of ponderosa pines out there. Uh, we want to hit some of the major considerations here. Again, natural features, drainage improvements, uh, utilities, water and sewer, and then again, a little more detail on the access here for you to look at. Um, our site here again is illustrated here over top of the existing uh, topography and, and, and landscape. Uh, we have a drainage, and I'm assuming you can see my cursor right there, okay. Um, the ma major drainage that comes through the site is existing, and we have water quality and detention that's being incorporated as part of that open space. As it moves through the site, uh, we have uh, a couple open spaces that anchor the property, one being uh, one of the city parcels and as well as some preservation that we're planning along here. Um, I don't see, I want to make sure too we, we cover, um, from a drainage standpoint, we're looking at addressing two things here. One is the water that's coming through the site. There's a natural, natural drainage here that carries water from up beyond the substation comes through the site so we're tracking that as well as capturing the on-site improvements uh, into a detention and water quality facility uh, right down here along the uh, just well just east of the highway um, so that will all be all be captured and we'll be maintaining uh, the existing 22 24 inch drains that go underneath the trail today and then that, that water will then hit the drainage that passes then underneath the highway. So historically, it should stop, uh, it should be consistent with what's there today um, as we control our existing new drain, drainage runoff. Um, as it relates to re utilities, I'm gonna back up one, can I just do that? Let's uh, scroll. scroll, okay, I'll do that, that works. Um, just real quickly, we have we have our water connection down here in the south corner, and we have sanitary that will come down through the, the street right of ways, uh, and then connect to an easement that runs all the way up to the church property to the north. There's existing undercrossing there and, and and connection point, which will then take it up to uh, all the way up, and so we can see that here. There's an existing right of way easement outside the right of way that runs up to the to the north, and then here's our water connection. Uh, just for reference, the 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 pressure producer building out there at the corner. Connections. Everything is coming off of sourdough. We have two dr two driveway access or road accesses off the sourdough. Uh, this is the entry of sourdough with the existing curb and gutter. Uh, the plan is to maintain and improve uh, this extension all the way to the north boundary. So new paving, new curb and gutter on both sides. Um, I know there were some questions about dust and, and the neighbor's concerns, and we've, we think we've uh, early on thought about that and we were addressing that with staff. Uh, here's a view from the north boundary looking towards the south for reference as well. Uh, and then again, just for context of how all this connects, we have sourdough with the intersection here, the trail, Highway 67 and Fairfield. Uh, just kind of want to uh, make sure that we continue to respect what's happening at the intersection. It's a busy, busy intersection. Um, access, as we continue on that, uh, we did do some traffic counts. We've had some preliminary discussions with CDOT. We've also begun to prepare our our access permit and stuff for the for the improvements. Um, there is a about a 500 foot taper and desail lane that's being planned uh, that would run along the shoulder of the road here and make us uh, a little safer um, exit onto heading north into the neighborhood. Um, again, we think another important part of of what this property has a role in doing is preserving the corridor as you head out of town. Um, there's you know, the beautiful trails and the setbacks that we want to protect and represent. 
With that, we look at, um, at the back of all of these lots along 67, we are, we are proposing, while there is a, a normal setback, we are also preserving, uh, providing a, an additional 30-foot preservation zone along there that is kind of reflected in this little cross section. And, uh, and then we're also looking at kind of some little landscape enhancements, both throughout the project edges, along the edges of the project, but most likely uh, the most visible ones will be along here at 67. And we're just looking at some, some decorative, you know, uh, rustic fencing and some wildflowers and stuff as an, an enhancement there that would go along with some of the other mitigations that we're doing. Um, I'm going to try to keep this short and sweet so we can get on to some, maybe some questions. Also, part of what we're doing is looking at um, developing kind of CCNRs for the architecture. And while it's not finalized yet, we're, we're in that process of developing um, what you would see here, some character vignettes that would help communicate the expectations. And uh, both the owner and the, and the builder are very keen to um, seeing that through as an important part of the project itself. And I think that would also be consistent with what you're seeing then to the east of the sourdough as well in that neighborhood. I would leave it there with questions um, and, and hand it off to staff as a, as a lead into the process. Thank you, uh, Jim and Mr. Chairman. I'm going to sit while I do my presentation. <laughs> so this is the Pines at Tamarack proposal for a 26-unit single-family residential subdivision. It's also an application for a PUD amendment and preliminary plat. Uh, and tonight is June 13th and is the Planning Commission public hearing on this. As the applicant stated, the site is in the northern edge of the city opposite the golf course. And you can see here it's a, a triangular piece that is located adjacent to Sourdough Road, adjacent to the highway. This is the golf course here to the west and Lucky Lady here coming down into the golf course and into some of the residential development. This is Masters Drive down in here, Trout Creek, which is a FEMA floodplain through the golf course. And on the east side of the highway, you can see here is a trailhead owned by the City of Woodland Park a subdivision, residential subdivision, the reserve at Tamarack immediately to the east. And this dashed line is the Teller County City of Woodland Park boundary. And you can see in Teller County there is a small subdivision immediately north of this site and um, larger lots immediately to the northeast in Teller County. The Woodland Park Christian Church was the original, these two triangular pieces, you'll hear me talk about triangular pieces. This one was part of the original um, annexation into the city as was this southern triangle. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of the site. And again, tonight we're here to consider the final development plan under the current PUD zone district. So it's not a rezoning application. It's a final development plan. PUD zone district will remain in place. We're also here for the preliminary plat, which is the layout for the 26 lot residential subdivision, all on 20.61 acres of lot two Day Springs Christian Fellowship subdivision. Um, again, the general location in an air photo showing you that this triangular 20 acre parcel is in the northern end of the county. You can see the golf course here on the west side of Highway 67. So it's just some quick background. In 1992, 468 acres known as Hawk Ridge was annexed into the city and all of it was zoned PUD. Um, in 1993, 428 acres on the west side of Highway 67 was master planned and that's what you're seeing with the golf club, the golf course development and the residential development on that side of the highway. Um, the other 40 acres roughly on the east end of the highway um, never did uh, go through, uh, uh, 
they went through approvals, but they never went through developments until to, uh, in 1999 when the North Triangle, what is now Lot 1, was rezoned from PUD to suburban residential, and then Impact Church came in, um, the Day Spring Christian Fellowship did a two-lot subdivision, and then Impact Church built in 2002 the church that sits on the site right now on Lot 1. Lot 2 was never developed. Um, but the PUD zone district still exists. Uh, it has gone through numerous attempts at development, and it was always proposed as residential slash commercial slash church properties. Um, and what we're seeing today is not um, unlike what we saw in 94 or 96 when previous proposals came in with the uh, residential development. So this is an aerial showing you the neighborhood surrounding the site. So beginning here with the, the City of Woodland Park Wastewater Treatment Plan at the north end of Highway 67 um, as it curves around. And then the golf course, um, Lucky Lady coming into the golf course on off of Highway 67. This is the clubhouse for the golf course. And this is where the intersection with Highway 67 and Fairfield Lane exists. This little triangular piece here to the south is the trailhead for the Centennial Trail, which aligns along Highway 67 on the east side. Um, after Fairfield Lane, it intersects with Sourdough Road, which abuts the site immediately to the east. And this is Kendora Pines subdivision in Teller County. This triangular piece right here, approximately, is the Impact Church site, and that is the church that you're looking at there. This subdivision here is within the city of Woodland Park. It is the, ta the reserve at Tamarack, and there are uh, a, quite a few number of vacant lots within this subdivision, and one that is along Sourdough Road. And this is the um, substation for IREA in Teller County. So the boundary from the city and Teller County jogs around this perimeter. So that gives you a general layout of the neighborhood. This again is the site showing you the subdivision immediately to the north, the substation, the lots immediately to the east in the reserve, the golf course, and Lucky Lady coming off of the north end. This is the intersection that would access Fairfield Lane and then Sourdough, and the two accesses into the site would be off of Sourdough. And you can see this gives you an, a good idea of what the vegetation on site looks like, heavily treed, um, pretty much undisturbed. So here are some photos on 67 looking north, up, up 67, Highway 67, and then also looking east into the site. So this is the intersection of 67 and Fairfield Lane, and here you can see where Sourdough Road goes on the east end of the site. This gives you a good idea of what the trailhead looks like. Here is the little parking lot, a little bench, a little uh, dog station, and this is what Centennial Trail looks like as you're walking north parallel along Highway 67. This is at the intersection of Fairfield and 67 looking down Fairfield Road. This is the site up in here, and this is the trailhead area on the city of Woodland Park property and there's the dog station right there. So this gives you an idea of what high, uh, Fairfield Lane looks like in terms of the construction of that road and the access that would the vehicles would be coming into. So this is on Fairfield Lane now looking north down Sourdough Road and a portion of Sourdough Road is improved as the applicant has shown on his photos. It has curb and gutter on both sides and the applicant proposes to extend this road with the asphalt surface and curb and gutter on both sides all the way to the north end of their site, uh, of their property. You can see there are no sidewalks on either side of Sourdough nor is the applicant required to provide any and he, it, they are not looking at providing any at this point. But they will be extending the curb and gutter all the way down Sourdough to the extent of their property. This also gives you a good idea of what the site looks like with the trees and some of the slight gradual slopes, also the electric lines on both sides of the site. So this is further up Sourdough, again still looking north and you can see that the road is unimproved. Here's the site that we're lock looking at. This is the, ta the reserve at Tamarack here on the right hand side to the east of the site. So. Now this is at the northernmost corner of the um, site 
on Highway 67 looking south. This is the site. Impact Church is, is right behind my cursor. And you, you can see here, this is the entrance at Lucky Lady going into the golf course and some of the development into the golf course and the highway and what you would be seeing from Centennial Trail. All right, so this is a zoning map. The site that we are in, in consideration of tonight is this triangular piece right here, which is zone PUD, which is that light purple. And you can see all of this was zone PUD with the original annexation into the sea. Immediately to the east of the site is the Reserve of Tamarack. That is zoned suburban residential with a public trail, public semi-public land zone district going through parts of it. And then immediately to the north, this is the Impact Church site, and that is zoned suburban residential. It was recently rezoned um, a decade or so ago. And the black line is the boundary of Teller County and the city of Woodland Park. So that is the zoning map. And this is the comprehensive plan that shows that the site has been designated as a single family residential um, site for development. And you can see that is the yellow, which is what you're looking at. And all of the yellow areas is potential residential development. The green is open space, which is the golf course, multifamily along the highway on the west side. Um, so in, in other words, the community plan, the comprehensive plan, does want to see residential on this site. And it, it conforms with the plan designation. So this is the proposed final development plan and preliminary plat. It's very hard to read here on this slide, but a copy was distributed to all of you with the um, staff report. What it is showing is various open space tracks, especially along Sourdough, along the north end of uh, Kendora Pines, the south end of Kendora Pines. Here is a small little buffer um, and, and open space tracks for drainage and utilities. Um, and then open space and buffer along Highway 67. It shows 26 residential lots. It shows these two roads and this road here connecting um, the roads. And then inside, again, is an open space track that preserves the dry draw, which will have a trail. Uh, and again, these are proposed as public roads, not private roads. Um, the open space tracks will, and the drainage uh, infrastructure will be maintained by the Homeowners Association. Um, so those will be private. Sourdough Road here, again, they'll be improving it right up to their uh, northernmost property. And again, as the applicant stated, they are proposing a decel lane, about 500 foot tapered, um, coming up to this intersection with Fairfield Lane. So that's just a rough layout of the site um, and the application uh, as submitted for the preliminary plat and final development plan for the PUD. So staff did a complete review and analysis of section 1830, which is the chapter for PUD compliance. We looked at the purpose of the PUD. We looked at what modifications are required to the subdivision regulations with respect to this proposal, and only one is required, and that is the reduction of the right-of-way from a 50-foot right-of-way with curb and gutter to 45 feet. And to uh, mitigate for this, the applicant is also proposing 15-foot wide easements along both sides, uh, along the lots on both sides of the street. So we will still have a 75-foot um, wide um, a swath of land that is pretty much covered by easement or right-of-way. So there's still a significant width back there to uh, accommodate utilities and open space and setbacks. Final plan requirements with a PUD zone district, that's what this applicant has submitted. It shows the location, the size, the improvements, the density, the dedications, the uh, proposed dedications, the streets, the easements, the uses, height, bulk, any agreements that they're going to be coming up with, any covenants that they'll be working with, um, feasibility of water and sewer, phasing, which they're not proposing any, parking, landscaping, traffic. All of those considerations are included in their final development plan and um, what can be considered tonight. The open space requirements in a PUD, the final development plan, they're proposing 5.06 acres, which is approximately 25% of the site, where only 15% is required per the PUD standards. 
And then finally, they have proposed as part of the um, preliminary plat and PUD final development plan, development dimensional standards, which include uh, density limitations, use limitations, height, setbacks, and frontage. And they've also proposed um, consideration of parking and landscaping with this um, PUD final development plan. So staff has reviewed all of this and does find substantial compliance with the standards in the municipal code and recommends approval of the final PUD development plan. Uh, this was included in the staff report and what it is is the dimensional standards that this commission makes a recommendation to city council on. The proposed PUD final development plan standards are listed in the middle um, column and just for kicks, I uh, showed you what it compares to with the suburban residential zone district. So again, you can see that there's not a lot of changes. There's a little bit of an increase in density compared to the reserve at Tamarack, for instance. Um, they're looking at single family residences. Um, they're looking at not allowing any accessory buildings to um, within the PUD area. Um, you would be allowed accessory buildings in the Tamarack, for instance, in the reserve. They are looking at 5.06, 25% of the lot open space, where only 40% would be required in the SR zone district. Looking at 16,000 square foot minimum lots, um, and their lot sizes vary. The minimum lot size in the SR zone is smaller, 15,000 square feet. Um, and again, you can go down these columns, you can see that there's not a lot of difference with respect to setbacks. We're looking at a reduced setback on a corner lot, 15 feet instead of 25 feet that would be, be required in the SR zone district. So again, those dimensional standards must be approved by city council. Staff also did a complete review and analysis of chapter 1720, which is the preliminary plat standards. Again, the requirements um, require a drawing to be submitted, which the applicant has done. Then it requires a complete review of the zoning and subdivision regulation standards. And again, they are asking for a waiver of the right of way width from 50 to 45 feet. And it also looks at design, the purpose of the plat, the site consideration, street frontage easements, stormwater drainage, water, sewer, all of those types of issues which staff has reviewed. And staff does find substantial compliance with all the standards and does recommend approval of the preliminary plat at this stage as conditioned. So the staff recommendation for the PUD is approval based on the findings in the staff report and as presented at the public hearing of the request by Dave Gerritsen for PUD 19001, PUD final development plan for 26 family, 26 single family residential lots on 20.61 acres on lot two of Day Spring Christian Fellowship with an address of 205 Sourdough Road in the PUD zone and that the Planning Commission recommend that City Council approve the dimensional standards as shown in PUD 1901 um, final development plan. And then staff, staff has another recommendation for the preliminary plat with four conditions that based on the findings in this staff report and as presented at the public hearing, that the Planning Commission approve the request by Dave Gerritsen for subdivision 19005 preliminary plat for 26 single family residential lots on 20.61 acres on lot two of Day Spring Christian Fellowship of, with an address of 205 Sourdough Road in the PUD, PUD Zone District, subject to the following four conditions. And I'm going to read through the four conditions for the record. Condition number one, prior to the installation of infrastructure, the applicant shall submit and receive a zoning development permit for that infrastructure, which application shall include final drawings of everything that he's already submitted preliminarily. So a final utility plan with all profiles for water, storm, sewer, um, sanitary sewer, roads, everything. So the final utility plan, the final grading and erosion control plan, the final uh, street plan with profiles, the final drainage plan and report, the CDOT access permit, and the approved um, swamp from the state. Condition number two, prior to construction on State Highway 67 and prior to those improvements, the applicant shall receive um, drawing approvals and permits as required by CDOT. Further, the applicant shall amend the traffic impact study to indicate the correct number of lots, the correct access category for State Highway 67 and the Fairfield Lane intersection, and 
he they will amend it to also indicate that the riprap will be extended from the pond outlet to the C dot cross culvert or to the trail that bisects the uh, flow path. Um, the applicant has already updated the traffic impact study with the correct number of lots from 25 to 26 and an app and that summary was put on your desk and it didn't change the aver average vehicle trips by very much it increased it by 11 average trips um, so uh, and a lot of this other the riprap and and the pond um, with the CDOT requirements those will all be looked at in greater detail with the subsequent submittals of the final development plans or the final plat and all of the other zoning development permits that will follow with this um, so prior number three prior to conveyance of any of the proposed lots the applicant shall record a final plat which final plat will come before the Planning Commission uh, repair and upgrade sourdough road to city standards for the full length along the eastern boundary of lot two and if they don't repair it they, um, prior to the final plat, they have to enter into a development agreement, subdivision development agreement, which will secure that construction. Um, and then number four, prior to recording the final plat, the applicant shall submit all covenants, including deed restrictions that establish the homeowners association that will guarantee the architectural and landscape design. Um, and of course it's not proposed as a public road a private road any longer so that is struck and then park development fees will be required as well prior to recording the final plat so that is the final um, staff recommendation I have just two corrections to the staff report that I'd like to highlight for your information on page 9 of the staff report where it talks about based on the traffic impact study 26 new residential lots will generate 290 new vehicle trips that has been amended to 301 and then three two sentences down two lines down it says 17 vehicles would enter the site while 10 would exit that should be 18 vehicles would enter the site on that page and that's based on the amended and corrected traffic impact study done by the applicant and then on page 15 I make a statement under 1740040 streets, alleys, and easements. I say all roads on site are proposed as private and will be maintained by the HOA. As mentioned by the applicant tonight, they've amended their um, final development plan and their preliminary plat. All roads are proposed as public and will be dedicated with the final plat to the city. So that should change to reflect that. That concludes my presentation, Mr. Chairman. Um, if, if Jim would come back up and be ready for questions, I am ready for questions too. Commission, it's your turn. Uh, any questions of the staff or the applicant? This is the time for you to ask them. Anybody like to do that? I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, just, I can't hear you. Okay. Clarification. Once again, what is the open space? I've seen there's a number of different items listed. At several places, it's it's 5.06. The total on the plan of the areas says 5.06. It really has 4.61. Light up says uh, 4.75. Just what is the right number? 5.06. Okay, so the track table is incorrect entries. Uh, the current track table should reflect that. I just added the one that was provided to us, and that's 4.61. There's more particular reason why I'm asking the exact amount. Of this. Let's, let's, did you find that, Jeff? I, I have 5.6, but go ahead, or 5.06. Thank you. But go ahead. Well, the reason why I was asking if the requirements being satisfied at 15 percent open space. Uh, I'm not in general objection, I'm just, just trying to get some clarification. What the requirements yeah. are here. Um, in 18.30.090, space requirement for PD needs indicates open space should not include roadways, associated drainage, utility easements, and other infrastructure areas incidental to the project. There's a little less clause, but it seems like. Whatever that number is, a good share of it is drainage, easements, and the like. 
it, it should be noted that the drainage is also a multi-use trail and open space that's available for recreation as well. And, 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 and I grant there's an except, there's, there's an unless clause, unless a specific public good can be demonstrated which benefits the community at large, which I guess is the city. So somehow or other, in, in going ahead with this, we either need to change the provision here or everyone has to understand what we're doing some amount of open space is required unless there's a specific benefit identified in the community at large you've got to find 50, 15 percent that's not this other stuff infrastructure kind of thing. i mean granted this is not uh 15 percent isn't equal to a public park it's it's generally an open space and buffers it's more reflective in the corridor kind of ref, uh, uh, protecting that corridor character so we're not building houses right up to the property line. We're providing that preservation as well as the, there's an the easement, the trail, and then the preservation zone in there. So part of that is open space. And then we do have um, kind of those buffers to the, the adjacencies of the other, the other neighborhoods, so. Here's the point, it, it, clear, yeah. it, it appears not compliant. There's some less clause and there's some interpretation we consider if we've got what we need to have to both here and the future PUDs, I'd like to understand how this is applied and how it's, how it's going to be considered here in the future. Um, the second one that is, um, there is a wildfire mitigation plan. What is the requirement what's, what's the requirement to be satisfied by that? Um, staff a asks that the applicant look at all hazards that might exist on the site. In this case, it was a potential wildfire hazard. So it was a supplemental um, requirement that they submit it, and they did submit it, and they proposed mitigation that is related to the development and then the building. How is, how is this implemented going forward? It will be part of the covenants. We're requesting that the fire mitigation plan be part of the covenants, and they make statements on their landscape plan related to this is what the developer will do, and this is what the builder will do, and this is what the homeowner will be responsible for. I believe in reading the welfare mitigation plan. I could have missed one, but I don't believe it has any requirements stated in it at all. As I can give example, paragraph after paragraph indicates something should be done. It is recommended that something should be done. I believe there's no mandatory statement in the entire plan. It's it, that's kind of reflected on the on the PUD plan itself. So the guide it, it becomes more of a guideline that that the PUD would follow. I, I guess I would tend to consider the technical one. I, I'm not, I don't know enough to say what should and shouldn't be there, but the way of wildfire, I mean, presumably there's something that ought to be required, and I just didn't find it. So L1, which is the landscape plan, has a landscape accent program with fire mitigation activities right on there. So it talks a little bit about private open space, builder, homeowner obligation, those kinds of uh, brief points. But ultimately, the wildfire plan will be recorded with the covenants as that document. And then there are specific requirements that we will transfer onto the plat as plat notes as well. Um, and the covenants will be listed as the reception number on the plat. So the covenants will also state obligations. And there's nothing wrong with putting in on just you know, sort of future these things. It doesn't require that that plan doesn't require it to be recorded. But I appreciate hearing that it is recorded, so I know how they do it. Yeah. Um, the flood, 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 flood study, we did have some conclusions in it. Can you tell me how those are implemented in the plan? An example of things that are at the bottom of the first floor each house two feet above the road. So in, in a previous life when I've seen these things, we've actually not we've actually recorded minimum, minimal heights and such too. What? I intended to be sure that the engineering requirements will be reflected. I want people to move in the house and when the street gets flooded, the house gets flooded. Right. This is not within a floodplain? There are no requirements uh, for any kind of elevation. There's no base flood elevations. There's no requirements to upgrade the houses. There's, it's not a floodplain in any way, shape, or form. But the, but the engineering study did indicate did it. The drainage study? The drainage study. 
it indicates it's a zone that is not subject to any floodplain, which is what they call everything that's outside of the floodplain. Zone X? Zone X. X as in xylophone. Right, yes. and, and those studies come through in the construction plans. So when they build the street and the site is built, those those all get reviewed. No. Just building on construction. Yeah, it'll be you know we'll have a final drainage plan with the construction drawings, and when they go to build the streets, and then when they go to build on each site, we'll look at that drainage plan and it has to comply with the drainage plan. And our city engineer will also recommend revisions to the drainage plan if any are necessary. Anybody else? I have one quickie. Uh, one comment. Uh, um, I like the fact that you could have had two dwelling units, an acre, and you have reduced that in the interest of not having it be so dense. I mean, it's a beautiful piece of property. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that or not. Um, but, uh, okay. and, okay. <laughs> but uh, it, it's, I mean, it's laudable in an effort to try not to put as many dwelling units in there as the PUD regulation would permit you to. So that's just one comment. Doesn't require a comment back. I think to build on that, just from clear, uh, some additional information, you know, we did uh, stake out a preliminary center line for the roads. We walked it as the whole as the whole team, uh, so we had a chance to kind of evaluate what was really happening out there. Um, so we felt pretty good about that. And also, if you look, you know, at our plan, we've also got the 60 by 60 kind of building envelope. So even though that might move a little bit on the lot, the intent is to kind of minimize disturbance of the whole lot as a whole. And, and our builder could talk a little bit more about that as well if you'd like to. But. Thank you. And my only question was really around the um, people turning into Fairfield Lane um, and crossing the trail. Um, and uh, there'll be a modest amount. The studies indicate what the studies indicate of traffic now going into Fairfield. It's Fairfield Lane, right, off of 67. Correct. And you cross over the uh, Centennial Trail. Has there been any thought to highlighting safety issues so we don't have a, you know, a child that's hit on a bicycle? Um, I, I don't know. You know, it's not like there's going to be a flood of traffic, but there's, it's, we could accept there's going to be more traffic once this development is fully um, uh, done. And uh, I would just encourage the city, to the extent that they can, I'm not talking about blinking lights and, you know, the thing like in the center of town or something like that, but uh, just give some thought to the whole safety issue of people riding bicycles who don't pay attention and drivers who don't pay attention. And today it's pretty chill out there, you know, it's a lovely part of the northern part of town. And it'll still be lovely, but there'll be more cars turning into there. End of uh, Mr. Scanlon, that's a great comment. It may be a good candidate for a crosswalk, and our city street department is looking at those kinds of things. Okay, thank you. And I, I think something that's helping there will be the diesel lane. It gives people more time to slow down, think about what they're doing, and not worry about someone coming up on them. So that'll it'll help slow control that, that turn as well. So. Nothing from this property drains onto sourdough, does it? No, sir. Okay, because sourdough yeah. is quite steep, and it tends to be a mud flow down that street. Is the point of my question? I think th I, th I take it back. I want to be clear that there's probably a, a few feet because of the utility easements that run through there that that uh, do slope down there, but it's pretty minimal. 
And, and it should still have some shoulder to absorb some of that, so. Yeah, thank you. I've got a, a couple questions here. Uh, Sourdough Road, you're gonna do improvements, curb and gutter along the west side. Are we gonna do the east side as well? Yes. Okay, thank you on that. Um, and then you got the detail lot, a typical lot detail, and it's showing a 30 foot uh, rear yard preservation area and then we got a 25 foot rear yard setback. I didn't know what the difference between those two were. If you, if you notice, it, the 30 foot is for those lots along Highway 67. So we put an extra kind of separation or buffer built into that. The rest of the lots will have a 25 foot setback. So that means that 60 by 60 building envelope that we're looking at has to still fall within, within that setback of 25 foot rear setback. Does that make sense? So the typical lot detail is only for those lots abutting Highway 67, is that correct? Well, that, that detail is intended to kind of cover all of the, all the lots, but that there's a caveat of the extra 30%, extra, I'm sorry, 30 feet just along 67. Well, I'm a little confused where that's specific. So if I buy one of the lots, how do I know if I have a 30 foot or a 25 foot? If no build area in the rear of my property. It's shown on the graphic in the uh, northern end. So if you look at that, it says a 30-foot preservation buffer, and that's just along 67. Just along 67. Okay. Yeah, and then you can see that there is a, a buffer. Yeah, I do see that. So thank you. I'm sorry for my oversight. Um, so this was zoned as a PUD, but was never the PUD was never defined for this parcel. Is that? Or that is no correct. Current definition of that. Currently. And I wouldn't say defined. It was never master planned or a final development plan was never um, developed because it went through phases where they had proposed residential and commercial development and it got approved all the way up to a final plat, but then it never got developed. So this is an amendment to a PUD? This is an amendment to a PUD. We call it an amendment because the PUD zone district already exists. So all they're coming in for now is a final development plan. The previous planning that was done and approved expired. Without development, these, these master plans expire. These final development plans will expire, and that's what happened. So we're not amending something that already exists that's expired, so this is essentially a new PUD. Yes, without changing the zone district. This is the first development that we hope will actually go through to <laughs> final build. Okay. Um, and then the, the internal roads, they will have curb and gutter as well? Correct. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, if not, um, we'll open public comment. Do you have anything to bring up to me, Dave? No one signed up. Okay. Does anybody that showed up forgot to sign up and want to talk? Because we'll give you that chance. We have two. First one is over there. Name, address, serial number, all the above. Okay, right up here. Good evening, all, and thanks for the chance to ask some questions. My name is John Yarger, and I live in the Condora Pines development just north of the northern boundary. I don't know if. Uh, can you all see what's on the monitor? Mm -hmm. you see the, the little seven? Yeah, yeah put your. Right there, just throw that little 7041 marker as my line. Anyway, uh, I have a couple of questions, if, if you'll permit. Um, the, the original presentation talked about the, the east to west drainage. Um, the, the, the gradient of the land north to south is not nearly as steep as it is east to west, but there is some gradient running downhill north to south which would be from my property onto the northern side of this of this proposed development. I'm wondering if any study or research has been done into drainage in that direction. Mr. Chairman, do you want me to answer the questions or do you want to wait till he's... Okay. Um, and the applicant can address this as well. But yes, there is a... Um, first of all, there are no lots on the east half of that north boundary. So I think... Um, there's Chardonnay Road proposed there, and then immediately 
track B, which is part of the open space, is part of the drainage consideration. So drainage has been considered for this entire 20 acres, including the northern boundary and how everything okay. works. I'm not, my question doesn't pertain to drainage that occurs within the triangular development. I'm talking about drainage from the lots in Condora Pines, north of this development, and south of the development itself. Yes, the drainage study takes into consideration where the, the water is coming from and how it's flowing in and from and to the site from everywhere. <laughs> okay. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. This is just a, an ignorance question. The acronym CCNR was mentioned. I'm not familiar with what that stands for. Those are the covenants. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, is there any potential for property tax assessment changes in the adjoining areas outside of this development due to the fact that if that development would occur, would it change the property values of the surrounding lots? Um, we believe that there will be an increase in property values because of the quality of development proposed and because of vacant land is now being developed. But that's ultimately a decision between you and the county assessor in terms of going in to challenge your assessment if that's what you think uh let's see uh oh, before i forget is it possible that we can email somebody here in the city department and get copies of all the various powerpoint files that we're showing tonight? yes and actually the packet and all of the information the drainage studies the plans are all already online oh, okay. so yeah okay my last question is about water uh, I, I, I read that the water will be provided by the city, and I'm wondering uh, how many additional wells have been drilled or are planned to be drilled to supply the water. So the, wa the source for the water will be the current wells that we have within the city, and it will be attached to the city um, water and sewer systems. So we're not planning to drill any new wells. Yep, the um, director, Kip Wiley, who is the uh, Utilities Public Works Director, has looked at the water and the feasibility and capability for the city system to sustain these 26 new lots with water. Um, right now, we have the water to be able to provide these 26 homes with water. But that doesn't mean that we'll have it in the future. And that's always a question that we have when we have new residential development or any kind of development in the city. And there was a memo from the utilities director in the packet dealing with water provision. And it's the standard memo that he always provides. And, and it states, we have the current water now for these 26 lots. But there are other entitlements. And until they build, we can't guarantee water. So if this one were to build tomorrow, we have the water for the 26 lots. But but we have a build out of 12,800 people. We're about 8,000. So I think 26 homes will be okay. She's simply stating the fact legally of what we have. We can't guarantee water. That doesn't mean those 26 houses are going to run us out of water. Just so you don't look at it that way. That's all. And I wanted to add that our per capita share of water is 0 0.117 acre feet per person that we count on. And we have 1,475 acre feet that will be developed for our city to grow. Currently, that is our projected capacity, uh, but we are purchasing water rights as soon as we are able to, uh, they come available, and hopefully can expand that. Somebody else had their hand up. There we go.
let Sally uh, Riley, our planning director, direct, uh, direct that about Highway 67 and what's being planned for the future. So traffic is a very important consideration with new development and we work with, the city works with CDOT, of course, who owns the highways. And there is an organization called the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments that looks at traffic on a regional basis. And we are with the Metropolitan Planning Organization of PPACG. And so funding for improvements to the highway becomes quite competitive because we are in the same pool as Colorado Springs and El Paso County. So we sit at the table with our regional partners and uh, try to assign the appropriate funds for improvements. And Woodland Park has actually been pretty successful in being able to, over the past 20 years, uh, do improvements on Highway 24 and Highway 67 but we are in line with other communities. And so recently they are updating the 2045 uh, long range plan for the MPO. And uh, we have submitted a number of projects for that plan. And then, uh, and in fact, two of them are on Highway 67. The first one would be to widen the highway between Kelly's Road and Evergreen Heights. Uh, and in fact, there is a traffic signal that is planned for Kelly's Road and Stone Ridge. I went to a recent scoping of that uh, with CDOT and that should be going out to bid early next year and under construction next year. So that's the first improvement you're going to see on Highway 67. And then we have also submitted the request for consideration within the long range plan is this section of Highway 67 from uh, Valley View Drive to Level Gulch. So uh, in this portion is north of Level Gulch, as you know. And we will compete for a transportation improvement project. It's called the TIP. And we will have a call for projects and submit those improvements for turn lanes and decel lanes from Valley View to uh, Level Gulch. So it's a very competitive and uh, what the city of Woodland Park has done as a partner with CDOT is that we do have a capital transportation capital fee that is collected on every home and commercial development and those fees are used to match these million dollar projects millions of dollars of projects so the city has to come up with 17 percent to match these um, projects so it's a, everybody is very conscientious. We have traffic studies submitted. CDOT looks at those traffic studies and we work very closely with them to make sure that we're in line and in the queue to get those funding. Okay. One, one thing to add to what uh, Ms. Riley added is that uh, Norm Steen, our, uh, our county commissioner, is the current president of the, of, of the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments, and uh, Neil Levy, our mayor, is the vice chair of that same group. And I'm the representative from Woodland Park for what's called the CADGET, the CAT Committee, which is the citizens part of that same project. And plus we have people from Teller County and that, so at those meetings we have plenty of representation. Okay. I, I guess all I would ask is, is, is given the competitive nature of the funding is that maybe we put the brakes on some of these projects until those things get put in place and make it contingent with with adding all this additional traffic uh, 
to, to what we're going to have already. Um, I like the fact that you guys are willing to put in the diesel lane, and maybe that's how we need to handle this. If we can't get public funding, then I would say the developers should maybe fund some of this too if they want to. You know, we have to worry about water, and I think we have to worry just as much maybe about traffic. Too. That's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Osbach, you know the drill of rank, name rank serial number. Absolutely. Good evening. My name is Bill Osbach, 675 Pembroke Drive. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission, the City Staff, I would only ask uh, for you to consider one item, and that's so much that you've stipulated a timeline for the improvements to Sourdough Road. I would ask that you consider some other uh, similar kinds of stipulation for construction of the diesel lane uh, so that it is specifically time to uh, do something just uh, so that it doesn't fall through. That's the only comment I have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is that something we need to add to this? Mr. Chairman, let I do believe I've added it, but let me find out how I put it in here. So with the zoning development permit for the infrastructure, one of the requirements is we need the approved CDOT access permit. That would be part of the desail lane approval as well. So that's prior to even breaking ground on the infrastructure. Um, and then I have condition number two, prior to construction of State Highway 67 improvements, the applicant shall re receive appropriate drawings, approvals, re permits, requirements by CDOT. Um, so I think it's covered under the conditions as written. And then under condition number three, prior to conveyance of any proposal, that's where we require the Sourdough Road upgrade. I, I believe that the diesel lane is adequately covered. Sure. If, if I may uh, politely disagree, um, the, the, access, the access permit does not guarantee the commencement of construction. The drawings and plans don't guarantee the construction. Now, I think Laura's done a good job of, before conveying lots, the, that the improvements to sourdough uh, be made. I think similar language probably ought to be included that before conveyance, the turn lane is also constructed and accepted by CDOT. That and would I would think they'd have to do that for start construction because all the trucks are going to turn off there to build this thing. I, I would hope so, but I would assume nothing because uh, my experience has shown me that these things can happen. And I think in the interest of the neighborhoods and the development, it just would behoove us to be specific at this point to say when that must be done. Thank you. Thank you. For clarification, Mr. Osbuck is a former uh, uh, public, works, public city works director engineer. of the city of Woodland Park and he's retired from that as at this point. So thank you for your comments. Mr. Chairman, um, staff does not object to adding the desail lane after Sourdough Road under Condition 3B. Any, anybody else? If not, we'll close the public hearing at this point. And uh, any rebuttal from either of anybody that wants to talk? That means the applicant or staff. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate the opportunity to, to make those clarifications as, as questions came up. Uh, we'll be happy to work with staff to finalize and clean up any little uh, nuances of the submittal package, um, and we'll do that as soon as possible. So. Thank you. At this point, um, any final questions before we start talking to each other? Hearing none. Okay, we uh, at this point can ask anything in deliberate deliberation. Close the public comments. Yeah, well, it, I did that. Public comments. I'll close that. But anyway, anybody, anything we want to talk about? No. Jerry. Yes, I was. Uh, I was glad to see that I changed this from a private road to a public road. Uh, I was concerned that making So, 
their uh, typical road section showed the opportunity and space for that sidewalk. They don't actually show it in their site plan. Uh, it's not required. So, Mr. Chairman, shall we bring up the applicant, or shall I answer that question for the applicant? Well, the uh, Jim. Bring, uh, there's another reason I bring that up. Is in the uh, elevation examples, it says we intend strongly encouraging. That's not very I would imagine that the covenants that have to be submitted in draft form with the final plat will be more specific. And again, those will come before you, and typically these covenants are standardized. There's an architectural committee established, so it will go through that architectural committee. They'll also specify in those covenants the exterior materials, the roof structure, the, those types of things, and we'll have an opportunity to look at those at that time as well. And we would hope it reflects the samples that they've submitted at this pre so preliminary So we'll have stage. another opportunity to look at this on the final plot. Yes. Okay. That's still Well, if there's no HOA in place, every member of that community has the opportunity to litigate to enforce their own covenants. Anybody else? At that point, we'd be encouraging a motion in a second. I'll make a motion, or at least I'll attempt to. It's a large mouthful. Um, but I'll move, uh, and since there's two parts, I'll move first that uh, we um, recommend approval of the PUD final development plan for the 26 single family residential lots on, may I just abbreviate and say on this site? And then there are no, I think, amendments or additions for that part that I can recall in our conversation. Um, and then the second is that we recommend approval of the, um, the preliminary plat. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry, Commissioner Scanlon. Um, you do need to recommend that City Council approve the dimensional standards for the PUD. That was understood. Recommend that the City Council approve. Okay. All right. I don't know who else would approve it. Um, but recommend that the City Council approve the dimensional standards in the PUD and that based upon all this, that final recommendation for approval is of the preliminary plat. And then there are several staff conditions one, two, three, and four, and that they go with the recommended approval. That was a mouthful. As proposed with the addition of uh, the desail lane. Yes, and and add the detail lane with the uh, more specificity as we recently discussed. That's fine. Thank you. We're looking for. I think so. We have a second. Charlie. Charlie seconded. Second. We have a motion and a second. We'd like to call it. Watson. Yes. 
Brown? Yes. Carrick? Yes. Good? Yes. Hartsfield? Yes. Penland? Yes. Scanlon? Yes. Schrader? Yes. And DeVoe? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. The only thing we got left to do is to wrap up the reports and that kind of stuff. But appreciate everybody that showed up. If you don't have another opportunity, this will be before council. I believe, right? And we'll also be back here for the final plat. So you can look at what the finished product is going to be. But thanks for those who got up. Thanks for coming. Okay. Let's go on to reports. Do you like my report first? Or? Of course. Okay. Uh, just a couple of quick reports to let you know that we do have a meeting on June 27th. We have two hearings scheduled, a final plat for Stone Ridge filing number three, and then we also have a rezone and a conditional use for property on Bowman Avenue. We'll also have a brief work session uh, to talk a little bit about upcoming um, amendments to the municipal code. And tonight, we would like to hand out two drafts of the municipal code one is uh, a housekeeping draft uh, for the Board of Adjustment uh, regulations. And we wanted to get that into your hands because we'll be scheduling that in July uh, for public hearing. So if you have any issues uh, with these housekeeping, we'd like to know that before we bring it forward formally. And then the second ordinance deals with uh, uh, modifying our side setbacks so that eaves can penetrate into the eight foot side setback uh, by two feet. Uh, we're running into many variances, uh, especially on the small uh, lots of record where we're seeing infill in our community and the Board of Adjustment would really like to uh, see, see this modification. And we believe that it would still maintain the integrity of the setback without harming it. In fact, most communities do measure their setbacks from the foundation and not from the eaves. So I uh, want you to take a look at those and give us uh, a holler if you have any concerns. Otherwise, we're going to move forward with uh, public hearings for these two ordinances in the near future. And may I just add that it relates to all setbacks, not just the sides, the way it's written. If you want it to be restrictive, more restrictive, let us know. Um, and I intend to invite the Board of Adjustment members to come to this next Planning Commission hearing so that they can stand up for themselves. Is it possible instead of doing a broad, this is, we're going to go ahead and make exceptions and make a permanent change to the, going from the roof line to the property line, could we just have a section that we come up with similar to the different divisions of the, could, could we just add something in there for fill-in lots that these are the requirements rather than lowering the standard of all of Woodland Park because of a few fill-in spots? I don't think we should be lowering our standards as a whole. I mean, if it's a fill-in lot, there can be exceptions made and have a section in the planning book for fill-in rather than reducing our standards. That's, that's an interesting proposal, but I think that that would be very difficult to administer because what is an infill lot? You'll have a discretion on that. It would maybe be only the urban residential zoned lots. We'd have to tie it to a specific zone, but, but that's a thought. So give us a call. We'll, we'll give that some thought and uh, maybe we'll, we'll talk about it some more at the work session on the 27th. Okay. 
because i think we're better than that we shouldn't be lowering our standards we should be keeping them the same okay anything else on your reports uh let's see i did want to ask everyone uh about the packets whether you prefer to receive uh complete paper <laughs> packets whether you would prefer just to receive the electronic copies and then if you would like to have uh, hard copies we can make those for you upon request uh, we just wanted to get some feedback uh, to try not to generate so much paper I don't think we need all of these I don't think we need them but if there's a packet with these are hard to read in my, in my elevated age, even the large ones too. So uh, any kind of drawings certainly need to be in paper. Uh, all the same, sometimes it's easy to put the whole packet together. But, but at the very least, anything larger than a standard 8 by 11 sheet, please, I can like Because otherwise, I, I just can't read it. Yeah, the the other thing I've, I've, and I've recommended is that for the folks that want to, down, put it electronically and put it on your tablet. Bring your tablet with you if you want to, and you can scroll through them or something to the effect so that there's a lot of paper there that they have to have for preservation. But I don't know if it's necessarily for us to have to read that whole thing on fire mitigation or whatever. I read it. Half that stuff, well, but you know, you're retired. Uh, so all, I, all I'm saying is available if you want it, but I don't know what to I, I think it's fine if we get it electronically and then if we need a hard copy of some yeah, of these you more detailed documents, request a hard copy to pick them up. Yeah. Ditto. That would work for me. Same here. The advantage of having hard copies to be able to have reference material here in the I think it's the staff important hard copy beneficial. There are other things that we refer to as comments come up. If you take the master plan, the big one we fold out, you can't see that on 8 and by 11. At least I couldn't read it. You almost have to be able to open that up to, to see what we're talking about for the 55 feet to 30 It's hard feet. to look at it on It really is. It's really Mr. difficult Brown, to look at it. Documents that are submitted that are larger than 8 and by 11, they should have hard copies. Maybe buying us all glasses would be an option. We can provide the staff report. Um, to you ahead of time or on your desk for the evening uh, or and we certainly will provide the large drawings large format drawings for you okay we appreciate that thank you while we're on that uh, same type of thing of saving paper or whatnot I feel we should probably bring our own water set an example and, and not have I know we used to have it poured and that really uh, is a lot of effort, but I, I think we could bring our own. There's something. How does everybody else feel? You can have mine back. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't open mine either. I like this water better than the stuff that they pour in. Yeah, I don't like the The city water. city <laughs> water. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Anything else? Nothing. Is that it? <coughs> Anybody else? Everybody yes. Go home? I have. <coughs> this was football season. I do have one thing to bring up. Yes. Um, as staff knows I, and the commissioners, I provided a memo to everyone pertaining to case number SRP, SPR 19001, Village at Tamarack. And the only thing I'm requesting right now is a discussion from officer council from legal staff to um, tell us why we can't discuss this as a planning commission you're asking for us to get a report back why is that what you're saying i'm asking for the our lawyer to tell us why we can't discuss this as a planning commission so planning commission it's not before planning commission to make a decision the way the code has been interpreted by staff so we're following what the code dictates at this point it's 
states that it's an administrative process, and so that's the process we're going forward. So ultimately, because Planning Commission doesn't have any plenary authority to make a decision on that issue, there's no point in discussing it as a board. I know that there's been a lot of feedback in the community. We're trying our hardest as staff to ensure that the process and, and uh, parts of the code are being preserved as best as we can to avoid liability to the city um, and per be respective of the property owner and their property rights as they navigate the code. And certainly has been brought up earlier and by several folks in the community, perhaps as a whole, uh, looking at portions of the code into the future as to how we uh, resolve these issues and what changes to the code might need to be made. And certainly that's a good discussion to have. There's ample opportunities for adjusting the code to make changes that will make uh, the process more effective. You know, you got two ordinances in front of you as of right now, and I know there's others in the works. Um, but it's certainly that application has already been filed. It's it's that individual or individuals who own that property have a certain expectation and right to have the code as it currently sits apply to that project, not necessarily as we'd like it to be in the future. And a change course partway through that process could create problems for the community and the city specifically. I don't know if that answers your question. Just a related question. If the Planning Commission doesn't agree, or any commissioner, or several commissioners don't agree with the process, where do we get our input? So there's an appeal process that's open to anyone. There isn't any specific appeal process that's special for Planning Commission or Planning Commission members. Um, if I don't know that I've ever seen that in a code where Planning Commission members have any special authority in an appeal process. Um, it's not dictated in the code that if before anything goes above the Board of Adjustments, as an example, that any special considerations for Planning Commission are submitted, but certainly the appeal process is open to anyone. And when it, in regards to the code as a whole, if you feel that there needs to be updates or changes, that's certainly a discussion that we need to have, um, not only as it pertains to that issue, uh, as a big picture, not necessarily to that project, but as a big picture of the code, if you believe there needs to be changes, that's what we need to be aware of. Um, your ideas, your thoughts, you know, specifically, the two, as an example, the two-foot easement, whether or not we need to adjust the language differently rather than a, a not easement, but two-foot eave. Um, if that's something that needs to be adjusted, you know, certainly we're looking at that as an option as well. The problem with that response to me is that and I don't want to say anything to jeopardize anything with the city going on right now, but the problem I see is that you're talking about the future, and I'm talking about the present. Property developers have a reasonable expectation that when they come to the city and submit an application, that the code will be applied as it is today, not as people want it to be, and change in the middle of the process would be inappropriate. Okay. Then last question, would I be um, in conflict of interest if I joined a public group that appealed this decision? Seeing how this isn't an issue before Planning Commission, I don't see that would be something that would affect you uh, or your position. I'm, I'm sorry, what did you, I'm sorry. This isn't, it's not an issue coming before Planning Commission as an appeal, so ultimately if that's to do so it. I could. Do so, it. so I or any commissioner could join such a an appeal public group. Certainly. Okay. Because you're not a decision maker in the process. Right. City that's council a, and the board of adjustments okay. are the that's ones that I need to be preserved. What about joining the county or the um, council meetings? You can and certainly that's one attend. Coming up, do we have the right to speak? Um, all of us, each one of us, get up and why we feel. And it needs to go through based on what's the written in the planning binder. So what's before City Council at this point is nothing because the decision hasn't been made on the project from right. staff. So to come to Council at this point is premature because there hasn't been a decision made as to whether or not this pro pro or that particular project is even going to be allowed. I thought the project was coming up according to the minutes 
and according to the last um, council meeting, it so was coming was, up on the 26th. So there's the potential for the water tap issue to be heard before city council. That's been uh, postponed to make sure that we're handling all our decks right in a row, make sure we're not conflating issues. Um, so that's not go on the council agenda for the 26th. I think almost what we need to do is probably have some time in executive sessions so we can figure out where in this book you guys came up with something totally different as to the letters that had been written so we can understand why why are we or good some of us are interpreting in this one way and you guys are interpreting the planning another way please feel free to contact me make an appointment and we'll discuss it on one-on-one -on -one. it is not a case before the planning commission it you can certainly as an individual citizen come discuss it be part of the process I would feel intimidated coming in on a one-to-one -one basis I think there should be several members there to talk about it you have to understand the process has not taken place that the planning director has the has the authority to whether to approve or deny this project that you're talking about that has not taken place yet once that takes place it can either go to council under an appeal or it can go to the board of adjustment under appeal but that decision has not been yet made yet so there's nothing to do until that happens right. so you're still taking comment public comment or anybody's comment can come in and talk to you about what you've you found because according yes. to the original letters that were sent out it was we had to respond by the sixth in writing that is the way the code is written and we must follow the due process but I'm happy to sit down with you and explain where we are currently in the process and you can provide your input on any case at any point as a citizen so you will if I come in you will say well in 18.00 whatever yes this is where the exception yes is. ma'am yes and ma what I have a question on is how come if how many other exceptions are in this we need to tighten this up so no. that there are I will no explain the interpretation of the code and how the zoning officer is applying the code Who's I the had a very officer? I had a I had the exact conversation that Sally is encouraging you and anybody else to have I, we had a conversation over the phone it was really helpful um, I'm satisfied whether or not I like it is not the issue I'm satisfied that they're following the process that's outlined in the code currently and that it's out of our jurisdiction if I as a citizen want to come and speak to the project whenever that appropriate time comes I'm fully allowed to uh, do that end of conversation as far as I'm concerned I, I heard one, one, one item which does sound like that it needs to be reviewed, the ordinance needs to be reviewed. Uh, it's, it seems to me since there's, there are other zones that could be affected in the future, and the process of changing the ordinance can be going to take some time, maybe that's what we should be starting sooner, sooner rather than later. The fact that uh, maybe, uh, maybe our council can advise is the fact that one particular property is going on the current code does, it mean, does that preclude us from considering a revised ordinance or other matters that may come up in the future if we have, if we have to do everything serially Ab other, absolutely other come in and before the absolutely we can have the discussion and that's and I tried to make that point before perhaps I wasn't clear if you have changes that you think need to happen to the code we can certainly entertain what those look like and vet those and, and draft the ordinance language and go through the process. But what we can't do is change the code for a current project. I, I got that. So it's, it sounds like we're starting to address some curious concerns yeah. in the next yeah. work session. One could talk about an ordinance revision on this subject, or at least other, or any other areas that might apply. Separate question how do you read the current zoning ordinance with respect to the current map? Different question. Correct. Okay. Anybody else? This was football season. We'd be 
saying we're adjourned. It's MBA season, though. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Any do I have a motion to adjourn? Uh, so moved. All those in favor, say aye. 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 We're adjourned.